September 11th. In America, a day of solemn remembrance. In 2012, a day of violence in the Middle East. Demonstrators stormed the U.S. Embassy in Cairo, angry over a low-rent film made in the U.S. that mocks the Prophet Muhammad. In neighboring Libya, Ambassador Christopher Stevens is in Benghazi, a city known for upheaval. Stevens knew Benghazi well. During the civil war that ousted strongman Muammar Gaddafi, he lived there. He was in at the beginning when Secretary Clinton sent him over there to talk to the rebels and find out who are these people, what are they up to, should we be supporting them. Stephen's parents were proud that he helped the rebel-led coalition set up a new government. We were concerned about him and concerned about the work and, and appreciative of it. My name is Chris Stevens, and I'm the new U.S. ambassador to Libya. In May 2012, Stevens was promoted to ambassador. His job? To bring stability to a hot zone. Gaddafi's weapon stockpiles had been raided, and weapons were just everywhere. So one of the things that the U.S. was interested in doing, and in particular the CIA, was collecting weapons. That mission brought Stevens to Benghazi on September 11th, when he opened a cultural center and met with officials. The ambassador, Stevens, had met with a Turkish official in the special mission compound, the consulate there in Benghazi, and everything was quiet for them. That all changed when darkness fell. At 9.42 p.m., gunfire is heard outside the Benghazi consulate. Then, a loud explosion. Within minutes, dozens of armed militia charge the main gate setting fire to the barracks, headed straight for the ambassador's residence. By 10 p.m., Ambassador Stevens, Information Officer Sean Smith, and a security agent run to a safe room. Three men with guns against 120 with RPGs, machine guns, grenades. They would have been no match. An alert is sent to the CIA security team at an annex about a mile away. That alert also goes to the State Department and the U.S. Embassy in Tripoli. Using a cell phone, Chris Stevens calls Deputy Mission Chief Gregory Hicks at the Embassy. And he said, Greg, we're under attack. <laughs> a few months before the attack, Stevens briefly cut back on his morning runs. After extremists posted his jogging routine online. I do know from his diary that they found he recognized that there was danger lurking in these places. Jeff Porter briefed Stevens on the security risks. The best way to characterize the security environment in Benghazi on September 10th and September 11th was that it was unpredictable. There was no law and order, and so while it was probably unlikely that something bad was going to happen, were something bad to happen, it was likely to be catastrophic. Stevens made repeated requests for more security. Guard booths and gates were added to the Benghazi compound as part of $100,000 in upgrades. But they still didn't have enough people. Why was manpower so lacking in Benghazi? We're essentially talking about as a CIA mission in Benghazi, whose, whose purpose was to collect information, to collect weapons potentially, and they may have deliberately wanted to keep a low security profile. CNN's Drew Griffin reports CIA agents have taken multiple polygraph tests to prevent them from talking about the CIA mission in Benghazi. But we do know that in July, diplomatic security agent Eric Nordstrom asked to have a 16-person special support team stay on as extra security until mid-September. That request went unanswered. Around 10.30 p.m., a fortified door with heavy metal bars keeps the attackers from breaking into the safe room where Smith and Stevens are. Minutes later, the attackers set fire to the villa with diesel fuel. And literally within minutes, the smoke overwhelmed Stevens and Smith in the safe area. About the same time, six American security agents leave the CIA annex. Former Navy SEAL Tyrone Woods is with them. 
After a battle, Woods and friendly Libyan fighters regain control of the consulate and start searching for Ambassador Stevens and Sean Smith. They found Sean's body and pulled it out, but he was no longer responsive. They did not find the ambassador. Back in Washington, word spreads fast about the attack. Defense Secretary Leon Panetta and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff Martin Dempsey meet with President Obama. So what happened at the meeting? Obviously, this is a very unusual event and uh, it, it has profound significance for the president. And by this time, of course, everyone's thinking it is 9-11. At 12.07 a.m. Benghazi time, 6.07 p.m. in Washington, the State Department sends an email to the White House, the Pentagon, and the FBI. It says the Islamic military group Ansar al-Sharia has claimed credit. If there was any thought that this might have been a spontaneous uprising, well, this clearly put that to rest. Three days before September 11th, a local Libyan militia told the U.S. the security situation in Benghazi was quickly deteriorating, warning the Americans to decrease their presence. There may have been a lack of situational awareness. They may have not been able to identify which of the dozens of violent armed groups in Benghazi posed a threat to the United States. We have breaking news. An American we can confirm now has been killed in Libya tonight. At about 1 o'clock a.m., an eyewitness captures a man being pulled from the smoke-filled consulate on video. This is the last image of Chris Stevens alive. At almost the same time, former Navy SEAL Glenn Doherty arrives in Benghazi with a rescue team from Tripoli. Kate Quigley is his sister. He chose to run in and chose to defend, even though it wasn't his job. He ran in. That's how Glenn has lived his whole life, you know. Anything you need at any time, he's there for you. By 4 a.m., Glenn Doherty and Tyrone Woods team up at the CIA annex. They're protecting at least 30 Americans against overwhelming odds. Literally, the 30 or so individuals that were there could have all been killed or captured. And then, the final blow. The full-on assault comes between 4 and 5 a.m. Libya time. And there were three mortars that were dropped that hit the roof of the building. It was overwhelming injuries. Glenn Doherty and Tyrone Woods are killed. I got a phone call, and from there, I had to then decide how to tell everyone. And how did you do it? There's no way to sugarcoat it. You just do it. Um, you know, getting a phone call that kind of alters your life forever is um, it's horrible. When the attacks on the consulate and CIA annex finally end, the assault has lasted nearly eight hours. Ty perished doing what he loved to do and doing it well. My son did the right thing at the right time for the right reasons. 30 Americans were saved, but four Americans are dead. My heart is broken because he perished the way he did, but at the same time, Assalamu alaikum. My name is Chris Stevens, and I'm the new U.S. Ambassador to Libya. I had the honor to serve as the U.S. envoy to the Libyan opposition during the revolution, and I was thrilled to watch the Libyan people stand up and demand their rights. Now I'm excited to return to Libya to continue the great work we've started, building a solid partnership between the United States and Libya to help you, the Libyan people, achieve your goals. Chris Stevens uh, worked with me in the State Department uh, in the second Clinton term when uh, I was the Assistant Secretary and he was the Iran uh, desk officer. But, but what stood out about him was, first of all, his, 
his jolly disposition, he, his uh, professionalism and his desire to be out on the front lines. He came to me, he wanted to learn Farsi so that he could be the first uh, diplomat on the ground when and if we opened diplomatic relations with uh, Iran. So it was natural that he would be the first diplomat on the ground in Libya. Uh, that was a dangerous uh, job and uh, he, he didn't flinch from it. Growing up in California, I didn't know much about the Arab world. Then, after graduating from the University of California at Berkeley, I traveled to North Africa as a Peace Corps volunteer. I worked as an English teacher in a town in the High Atlas Mountains in Morocco for two years and quickly grew to love this part of the world. Since joining the Foreign Service, I've spent almost my entire career in the Middle East and North Africa. But it'll be a long time before we forget Chris Stevens, because he will stand as a shining example of patriotism and love of country. I cannot be more proud of Ambassador Chris Stevens. Over my shoulder here, you can see the U.S. Capitol building. In that building, 535 elected representatives from every corner of America come together to debate the issues of the day. They are men and women from every religious, ethnic, and family background. I look forward to watching Libya develop equally strong institutions of government. We, we go back a long way, and he was a wonderful man who had a sense of the streets as well as the elites, and that despite the security restrictions that limit so many diplomats, he was always willing to go out. And he saw Libya through three, all three transition phases, two years under Muammar Gaddafi, then as the liaison chief in Benghazi for a year, and then as ambassador to Tripoli. I look forward to exploring those possibilities with you as we work together to build a free, democratic, prosperous Libya. See you soon. I want to turn now to the Benghazi story. In an interview last night, Hillary Clinton said she does not appreciate the politicizing of the Benghazi attacks. And when asked if, one, if it's one more reason for her not to run, here's what she said. Is that another reason not to run? No, actually. Just too much. Actually, it's more of a reason to run because I do not believe our great country should be playing minor league ball. We ought to be in the majors. And I view this as um, really, uh, apart from even a diversion from the hard work that the Congress should be doing about uh, the problems facing our country and the world. Senator, is this minor league ball? I don't think the issue of Benghazi is minor league ball. It is for Amer Americans have lost their lives serving our country. We need to investigate it to understand what went wrong so that the people responsible for those decisions can be held accountable and so that we can put in place measures so that it never happens again. That to me is a very valid inquiry. The, the State Department had at its disposal a steady stream of reporting about how dangerous and how much danger that facility in Benghazi was in. It is a fact that they did not take sufficient security measures and it is a fact that perhaps they shouldn't have even been there and it is a fact that they did not have an extraction plan in place that was sufficient. Who made that decision and, and is that uh, method of operating still in place now because Americans serving in Tripoli today in Libya are in similar danger? And I think those are legitimate inquiries and, and, and if she thinks that's not something we should focus on then perhaps that gives you some insight as to why this happened in the first place. Well she has apologized because she said it happened on her watch. I mean, do you hold her personally responsible for the security failure that you cite? Ultimately, this was a systemic breakdown of the State Department's security apparatus, and she ran the State Department. She should have known of the dangers that existed there. In fact, in a hearing we had here a year and a half ago, I asked her specifically about meetings she had with the Libyan government, in which she was made aware of the fact that many of these militias that were providing some of the perimeter security were unreliable and how dangerous Benghazi had become. The Brits had pulled out of Benghazi, the Red Cross had pulled out of Benghazi, the U.S. facility had already been previously targeted. So no, not only has she not been held responsible, no one has been held responsible. For, I think, believe four individuals were suspended with pay. All four have returned to work. Who made this decision not to have sufficient security? And are those types of decisions still being made? Those are valid inquiries, and she has to have some level of responsibility because if she's going to brag about her time at the State Department, she also talk, has to talk openly about their failures. Senator Rubio, thank you for joining us. Thank you.
But I want to stay in Benghazi based on what John asked, because you said if they want to come after me, come after me. Um, I wanted to ask about the families of these four Americans who were killed. Sean Smith's father, Ray, said he believes his son basically called 911 for help, and they didn't get it. And I know you've said you grieve for these four Americans, that it's being investigated, but the families have been waiting for more than two months. So I would like to, for you to address the families if you can. On 9-11, as Commander-in-Chief, did you issue any orders to try to protect their lives? Uh, Ed, you know, uh, I'll address the families, not through the press, I'll address the families directly, as I already have. Uh, and we will provide all the information uh, that is available about what happened on that day. That's what the investigation is for. But as I said repeatedly, uh, if people don't think that we did everything we can to make sure that uh, we saved the lives of folks who I sent there and who were carrying out missions on behalf of the United States, then you don't know how our Defense Department thinks or our State Department thinks or our CIA thinks. Their number one priority is obviously to protect American lives. That's what our job is. Uh, now, Ed, we're, we're, I'll put forward, I will put forward uh, every bit of information that we have. I can tell you that immediately upon finding out that our folks were in danger, that my orders to my national security team were do whatever we need to do to make sure they're safe. And that's the same order that I would give any time that I see Americans are in danger, whether they're civilian or military, because that's our number one priority. Joining us now, our ambassador to the United Nations, Susan Rice. Ambassador, welcome back to Fox News Sunday. Thank you. This week, there have been anti-American protests in two dozen countries across uh, the Islamic world. The White House says it has nothing to do with the president's policies. Let's watch. This is not a case of uh, protests directed at the United States. Uh, writ large or at U.S. policy, this is in response to a video that is offensive. You don't really believe that. Chris, absolutely I believe that because in fact it's the case. Uh, we've had uh, the, the evolution of, of the Arab Spring over the last many months, but what sparked the recent violence was the airing on the internet of a very hateful, very offensive video. Uh, that, uh, that has offended many people around the world. Now, our strong view is that there's no excuse for violence. It's absolutely reprehensible and never justified. But in fact, there have been those uh, in, in various parts of the world who have reacted with violence. Uh, their governments have uh, increasingly and effectively responded uh, and protected our facilities and condemned uh, the, the violence and this, this uh, outrageous response to uh, what is an offensive video. But there's no question that as we've seen with the, in the past with things like Satanic Verses, with the uh, cartoon of the Prophet Muhammad, there have been uh, such things that have sparked outrage and anger and this has been the proximate uh, cause of what we've seen. There is no statute of limitations when it comes to finding out the truth, particularly for those who have served and sacrificed and died under our flags. So, Mr. Hicks, let's find out the truth. The President of Libya responded to the attack and labeled it an attack by Islamic extremists, possibly with terror links, correct? Yes, sir. So, hours after our ambassador and three others are killed in Benghazi, the President of Libya says it was an attack with possible terror links, correct? Yes, sir, that's what I recall. Did the President of Libya ever mention a spontaneous protest related to a video? No, sir. When Ambassador Stevens talked to you, perhaps minutes before he died, as a dying declaration, what precisely did he say to you? He said, Greg, we're under attack. Would a highly decorated career diplomat have told you or Washington had there been a demonstration outside his facility that day? Yes, sir, he would have. Did he mention one word about a protest or a demonstration? No, sir, he did not. So fast forward, Mr. Hicks, to the Sunday talk shows and Ambassador Susan Rice. She blamed this attack on a video. In fact, she did it five different times times. What was your reaction to that? I was stunned. 
my jaw dropped, and I was embarrassed. Did she talk to you before she went on the five Sunday talk shows? No, sir. You were the highest ranking official in Libya at the time, correct? Yes, sir. And she did not bother to have a conversation with you before she went on national television? No, sir. So Ambassador Rice directly contradicts the evidence on the ground in Libya. She directly contradicts the President of Libya. She directly contradicts the last statement uttered by Ambassador Stevens. Mr. Hicks, who is Beth Jones? Beth Jones is the Acting Assistant Secretary for Near Eastern Affairs at the State Department. I want to read an excerpt from an email she sent, and you were copied on it. And by the way, Mr. Chairman, for our colleagues who like to trumpet bipartisanship, this would be a wonderful opportunity to demonstrate it. Some of these emails, even though they are not classified, have not been released, Mr. Chairman, including the one that I am going to read from. So for my colleagues who trumpet bipartisanship, this would be a wonderful time to prove it. This is from Ms. Jones to you, to counsel for Hillary Clinton, to Victoria Nuland, to Mr. Kennedy, near as I can tell, to almost everyone in the State Department, and I'm going to read from it. I spoke to the Libyan ambassador and emphasized the importance of Libyan leaders continuing to make strong statements. By the way, Mr. Hicks, this email was sent on September the 12th, the day after Benghazi, and several days before Ambassador Rice's television appearance. And I'll continue. When he said his government suspected that former Gaddafi regime elements carried out the attacks, I told him that the group that conducted the attacks, Ansar al-Sharia, is affiliated with Islamic terrorists. Let me say that again, Mr. Hicks. She told him, the State Department, on September the 12th, days before our ambassador went on national television, is telling the ambassador to Libya, the group that conducted the attacks, Ansar al-Sharia, is affiliated with Islamic terrorists. Mr. Hicks, I want to know two things. Number one, why in the world would Susan Rice go on five Sunday talk shows and perpetuate a demonstrably false narrative? And secondarily, what impact did it have on the ground in Benghazi, the fact that she contradicted the President of Libya? As the first question, I cannot provide an answer, but perhaps you, sh you should ask Ambassador Rice. I would love the opportunity to do just that. As to the second question, the at the time, we were trying to get the FBI to Benghazi to begin its investigation. And that talk show actually provided an opportunity to, to make that happen. Afterwards, we encountered bureaucratic resistance for a long period from the Libyans. The Libyan government at this time is not very deep. President, Prime Minister, Deputy Prime Ministers, Ministers, all capable people, some Vice Ministers as well. And it took us an additional two, see my math is not very fast these days, maybe 18 days to get the FBI team to, Bengh to Benghazi. So the crime scene was unsecured for 18 days? Yes, sir. Jennifer just reported the CIA requested military backup three times for the besieged U.S. consulate in Libya, and three times it was denied. U.S. Navy SEAL Tyrone Woods was one of the four Americans killed in the terror attack. He ignored the orders to stand down. He went to the consulate to try to save those in peril. He fought to the bitter end, all the way back at the CIA annex, trying to keep the attackers at bay. His body was found slumped over his machine gun, they believe he fired to the last moment. His father, Charlie, 
is not interested in political arguments, but he does want to know who in the administration made the call not to dispatch military assets that might have saved his son's life, instead leaving Tyrone Woods and the other Americans to fend for themselves. Charlie Woods joins us live now by phone. Charlie, your reaction to the breaking news? Well, thank you. I appreciate your introduction, and I do want to reiterate this and really emphasize again, this is not about politics. This is about, if it were about politics, it would dishonor my son's death. This has to do with honor, integrity, and justice. As you learn more about his final moments, how he requested right. backup twice, uh, right. three times, three times, and was denied three times, and how he ignored the orders to stand down, how he rushed to the scene to try to save the ambassador, mm -hmm. and ultimately paid his own with his own life for his heroism. Right. Your thoughts this, on that? this news that he disobeyed his orders does not surprise me. My son was an American hero. And he was going, he had the moral strength to do what was right, even if that would professionally cost him his job, even if it would potentially cost him his life. He was a hero who was willing to do whatever was necessary to respond to their cries for help. If, in fact, those people in the White House were as courageous and had the moral strength that my son Ty had, immediately, within minutes of when they found there was the first attack, they would have sent, they, they would have given permission, not denied permission, for those 130 C-130s to have gone up there and this is exact, I don't know much about weapons, but it's coming out right now, that they actually had laser uh, targets focused on the mortars that were being sent to kill my son, and they refused to pull the trigger. They refused to send those C-30s. To me, I'm an attorney. This may not meet the legal test of murder, but to me, that is not only cowardice, but those people who made the re decision and who knew about the decision and lied about it are murderers of my son. That's a very strong statement for me to make, but for their benefit, they need to clear their conscience, they need to stand up, and they need to change the direction of their lives. And I want to say right now, you know who you are. I totally forgive you, but I hope years from now you change the direction of your life for sure. your benefit. Charlie, do you feel like you are getting straight answers from the administration oh, this, on this? This is, this is all a path of lies. And that's one thing, as a father whose son was killed, I do not appreciate lies. I do not appreciate cowardice, and I do not appreciate lies. And, I, and I, I'm a loving person. I love my son, and I want to honor him. And I hope I'm not speaking too strongly, but I am very glad the facts are coming out right now. I do not. The reason I'm even speaking up, we, our family, had made the decision not to say anything. But after the facts came out that in real time, the White House, from minutes after the first bullet was fired, they watched my son. They denied his pleas for help. My son violated his orders in order to protect the lives of at least 30 people. He risked his life to be a hero. I wish that the leadership in the White House had that same level of moral courage and heroism that my son displayed with his life. As we look at the beautiful pictures you gave us of Ty when he was younger, when he was in high school, the picture of the two of you together, we remember his legacy. He is an American well, hero. Charlie, I'll give you the last word. He, well, you know, I appreciate that. And I, I, I sent you those pictures of Ty in, in high school. And I wanted you to show those to the people out there for one reason. And that is so that people could be inspired and to know that Ty was just a normal kid. Okay, we were an imperfect family, but we were a normal family. And I would hope that his legacy would live on and that we would raise up a generation of American heroes, and that they would be inspired by his pictures and by his life and that we would raise up a generation of American heroes that are strong morally and strong in every other aspect of their life. We do not need another generation 
of liars who lack the moral strength that my son, who is an American hero, had. Thank you. Charlie Woods, all the best to you and your family. And and I really, well, I really appreciate what's happening, and I really wish the best for those people that allowed my son to be murdered, and I mean that very sincerely. I want the best for them, but they need to stand up, and they need to change the direction of their lives. Thank you. Thank you. All the best, sir. I know I speak for a lot of our viewers when I say uh, your son will be missed, and we honor right. his memory today. Thank you for honoring him. Tyrone Woods. Thank you. We are going to have much more on this story. We're taking your thoughts on it right now. You can send them to me on, on Twitter at Megyn Kelly. I do read them. And still ahead, we will be joined by the former White House Chief of Staff under President George W. Bush, Andy Card, as well as General Tom McInerney, who said yesterday that more could have been done. Much more. Keep it right here on America Live. Well, Pam, it, let me begin with the obvious. As a senior U.S. diplomat, I agreed to a White House request uh, to appear on the Sunday shows to talk about uh, the full range of national security issues of the day, which at that time were primarily and particularly the protests that were enveloping uh, and threatening many diplomatic facilities, American diplomatic facilities around the world, and Iran's nuclear program. The attack on Benghazi, uh, on our facilities in Benghazi, was obviously a significant piece of this. When discussing the attacks against our facilities in Benghazi, I relied solely and squarely on the information provided to me by the intelligence community. I made clear that the information was preliminary and that our investigations would give us the definitive answers. Everyone, particularly the intelligence community, has worked in good faith to provide the best assessment based on the information available. You know the FBI and the State Department's Accountability Review Board are conducting investigations as we speak and they will look into all aspects of this heinous terrorist attack to provide what will become the definitive accounting of what occurred. On the deadly terror attack on the U.S. consulate in Libya, Fox News sources telling us CIA officers on the ground in Benghazi during the attack sent requests for help but were denied. National security correspondent Jennifer Griffin is live at the Pentagon with more on this. Jennifer. Hi, John. Well, sources who were on the ground in Benghazi during the attack tell Fox News that, in fact, there were three separate requests to aid not only the attack that was occurring at the consulate and to try and help with that attack, but also requests for outside help, outside military to help, to help once there were gunfires and, and uh, firefights at the CIA annex. Those requests, we're told, came from higher headquarters. They were told to stand down. There were, as you know, Glenn Doherty and Tyrone Woods, the former Navy SEALs, were over at the CIA annex at about 9.40 p.m. when the first shots were heard at the consulate where the ambassador and his team were taking fire. I'm told that they radioed to their higher headquarters that they wanted permission to go and help the ambassador, to help the ambassador's teams. At that time, they were told by their higher-ups to, quote, stand down. They waited approximately an hour. Uh, they requested again to send Glenn Doherty, Tyrone Woods, and other members of that team to help out at the consulate. They were again, for a second time, told to stand down. They ignored those orders. They made their way over to the consulate against orders. They helped rescue those who had survived at the consulate. They could not find the ambassador. They made their way back to the CIA annex about one mile away at midnight. That is um, approximately, the firing had started at 9.40 p.m., so that is approximately two, and a, two hours and 20 minutes later. They get back to the CIA annex. They begin taking fire almost immediately. Four mortars are fired at the compound. During that time, there was no problem with communications, I'm told, from sources on the ground. They were in constant radio contact with higher headquarters. They were calling for military support, air support. I've also learned for, from separate sources that there was at least one uh, special operations unit, most likely Delta Force, that was waiting on standby at Sigonella Air Base about 480 miles 
from um, from Benghazi. They could have been at Benghazi in approximately two hours. They were part of the commanders in extremist force, a SIF, they're called in the special operations community. They did not take off from Siganella. Typically, on the ground, when special operations forces are involved in a firefight like this, they can call in air support from uh, what are known as Spectre gunships. These are commonly used by the special operations communities, and sources in Benghazi who were involved in the attack say that no gunships were sent, no help was sent, even though the fighting at the CIA annex went on for more than four hours. Uh, this is somewhat explosive information that three requests were denied from higher headquarters to to not only help the ambassador and his team at the consulate, but also to send in outside military help that could have helped in this uh, ongoing firefight that went on for six hours and 20 minutes. A final point, John, we have confirmed that there were two uh, surveillance drones sent over Benghazi. One of them was sent into position. It was already in position over Libya at the time over eastern Libya. It was positioned shortly after the firing began. It had to re be replaced by a second drone uh, later in the evening. So there was always one drone up above uh, sending real-time video back to computers, back to uh, computers that could be accessed at any of the agencies here in Washington. Anyone with a clearance at, at CIA, Pentagon, uh, the White House Situation Room or at the State Department could be tapping into that real-time video from the drones up above Benghazi um, uh, on that night of September 11th and 12th. John? Jennifer Griffin at the Pentagon with some explosive information there. And, and so Doherty and Woods, who gave their lives in this attack, uh, tried to rescue the others, in fact, did rescue the others against orders, you're saying. And this thing could have been a lot worse had they not done so. It's just uh, incredible and so many questions left to answer. Thank you, Jennifer. And John, John, one final point. Glenn Doherty and Tyrone Woods were killed at 4 a.m. by a mortar shell. That is six hours and 20 minutes after the fighting at the consulate began. No. There, my source also tells me that uh, one of the team was on the roof with a laser pointer with eyes on the mortar attack team, mm -hmm. the Libyan mortar, sh the people who were shelling, that laser could have helped guide in any Spectre gunship or any other form of military help if it had been sent from Siganella. Or an armed drone even. Jennifer Griffin, again, we'll get back to you later. Thank you so much. In Benghazi, as the Senate Intelligence Committee has just released a report they've been working on for quite some time. And in this report, it's about 85 pages long, we're just starting to get a look at it, it strongly criticizes the Obama administration's response to the terror attack that killed four Americans, including our ambassador, Christopher Stevens. So the bipartisan report is now saying that al-Qaeda has established a haven in Libya well before that tragic night uh, in the eastern part of the country. The claims directly contradict the narrative that came out of the White House on all of this. Joined now by somebody who's been on this story from the very beginning, Utah Republican Congressman Jason Chaffetz uh, has been looking for answers. He's on the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee. Uh, Congressman Chaffetz, good morning. Good to see you this good morning. morning. Mark. All right, so let's take a look at some of what is in here. We just heard from Catherine Herridge, who has started to kind of cull through uh, this information. And, and one of the things that she said is clearly news here, is that there was a DIA report in July of 2012 uh, that Libya Libya was that there was an establishment of, of a very strong presence in eastern Libya by Al Qaeda. I mean, you know, I think a lot of people, you know, had that that feeling, and there was evidence to that. But this clearly states it. Uh, no doubt, the, the security parameter was such that there were over 300 incidents of security attacks uh, there in Benghazi. Uh, Al Qaeda was flying flags over government buildings. There is video that you can pull up on YouTube of parades where there were clearly these uh, militias, some with uh, Al Qaeda ties to it. Uh, I'm glad they've come to this conclusion and, and put this out publicly with the Democrats involved in this and saying, no, clearly Al Qaeda had a very strong presence. They had the, the motive to be there. They had the physical. Uh, facilities there. They had the personnel there. Al Qaeda was clearly in a town that's not very big uh, in the town na named Benghazi. 
You know, when you look back at that and you think about the pleas that Ambassador Stevens made for uh, security, that he was becoming increasingly concerned about what was going on. I mean, the British embassy had been attacked and they had pulled their diplomat out. Uh, so as you point out, it was no secret that things were not going well. Uh, you know, I, I mean, why wouldn't you? It begs the question. Why wouldn't you either pull out or provide more backup or have a plan? The military says they didn't even have an, an ability, a plan to get in there if they, if they were needed. April 6, 2012, our facility in Benghazi was bombed. June 6, 2012, our facility was bombed. They breached the wall. Five days later, the British ambassador had an assassination attempt. The Red Cross had a, a rocket attack. Um, all the Western flags had abandoned this except the United States of America. But Hillary Clinton, under her, under her watch, she wanted to expand the facility there in Benghazi, but they diminished the security presence. So we had less personnel. They didn't even get to keep the personnel that they had. And one of the key findings from this Senate report, I'm just reading the headlines as you are, is that this attack was preventable. It was. What they wanted to do in the State Department under Hillary Clinton was to quote unquote normalize as much as, as possible. And she testified that she said that the, the people on the ground made the security decisions. That was never the case. Eric Nordstrom, the, the regional security officer, was asking, pleading, begging for more resources, didn't get them. The ambassador wanted more resources and didn't get them. They, they diminished the security profile. They didn't fortify the physical facilities. That attack was preventable. That comes from a Democrats and the Republicans in the Senate. And that's what Hillary Clinton's got to live with. And we still have no, you know, no answers, no arrests. There's more in this no report on Ben Kumu, uh, this former Gitmo detainee who was released and is believed to be involved in all of this. So what's going on? We have this person at Gitmo and they release him. Now we've got him tied to the attack in Benghazi along with Mr. Katala and some other very nefarious characters. The, the, the media, U.S. media can go over and freely interview and talk to these people. We are well past a year and yet we have no arrests. We, nobody's been captured or killed. It took the FBI 21 days even to get to Benghazi to do this. Uh, it, it's just, this is why it's so important and why it matters. And it's so demeaning for the president and the spokesperson and others to try to label this as a quote unquote phony scandal. Yeah, it's tough. You know, you look at a lot of people fired up over a traffic jam uh, and yeah. you wonder where the answers are on this because we all clearly remember the president standing at that podium, very moved by the loss of American life and, and promising to those families that he would find the people who had done this heinous act uh, to four Americans. And, and that, it just leaves a huge question mark in, in so many minds. Uh, Congressman Chaffetz, thank you very much. We'll Thanks, see you Martha. next time. Thank you. Okay. All that Thanks. stuff about James Rosen and Jennifer Griffin saying yep. everybody knew it in real time yep. when it was happening. Martha, we have the report right here and we're still pouring through it here at Fox News. But what we were told in advance is that it really does shine the spotlight very brightly on the Al-Qaeda presence in Libya and specifically a former Guantanamo detainee, Sufyan bin Kumu, who we first reported here at Fox over a year ago, was a primary suspect in the Benghazi attack. And more recently, that bin Kumu was one of three suspects who had historic ties to the Al-Qaeda senior leadership. And I'm right now on page 10 of the report, and it cites specifically, and this is news, that in July, of 2012, so just a few months before the attack, the CIA produced a report that was called Libya Al-Qaeda Establishing Sanctuary, and it went on to describe how Al-Qaeda affiliated groups and associates are exploiting the environment in Libya to enhance their capabilities and that they are seeing sort of a, a mirror image of Al-Qaeda establishing a presence in Libya and uh, neighboring Egypt under the Jamal network. So again, what we see so far in this report is very strong evidence, reports by the Defense Intelligence Agency as well as the CIA prior to the Benghazi attack that Al-Qaeda was establishing itself in that area. And then again, this link mm. to the former Guantanamo detainee Sufyan bin Kumu. Very interesting. Mm. So uh, say again, Catherine, where the report that showed an increasing Al-Qaeda presence in Libya, who generated that? Was that CIA? 
Well, we've got several right here. There is one that was produced, uh, this is page 10, July of 2012, the DIA produced a report that discussed the founding, uh, discussed rather, the founding of Ansar al-Sharia. And it's noteworthy here that uh, this section, if you can come back to me one second, this section of the Senate report is heavily redacted, which mm -hmm. means it remains classified. And then right below that, it describes how in July of 2012, the CIA produced a report entitled Libya al-Qaeda Establishing a Sanctuary. And this comes on the back of our reporting here at Fox News that there was also a report prior to the attack by the Library of Congress that was declassified that again talked about al-Qaeda establishing that presence in Libya and most importantly that the likely new face of al-Qaeda in Libya was the former Guantanamo detainee Sufyan bin Kumu who we were first to report as a primary suspect uh, in this attack. Uh, secondly, and I think this is also important, is that it shows this report that Benghazi had a significant amount of premeditation.